for Doug and Gordon in particular, uh, can you connect your father's practical Christian teaching to your re robust, reformed faith? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe as a follow-up, how did that take place? What are some of the, the dominoes that fell in that process? So my dad, uh, the way I explain it is this. My dad is an old-school evangelical, and his defining uh, driving passion is to obey the text in front of you. Um, and this sometimes, and his, uh, the thing he reacts to is not so much reformed theology as it is any kind of systematic theology because he saw too much, and, and, and he saw too much uh, systematic theology getting in the way of obeying the Bible. So systematic theology can be a, proc a Procrustean bed that you make, you can adjust the verse to fit whatever your theology is. So he didn't like that, but he would also, um, depending on what passage was in front of him, sound very much like a Calvinist or very much not, right? Because he just wanted to do what the Bible, what's the passage in front of you saying? My attitude toward systematic theology is, uh, in my discussions with him, I said, well, I think we should be allowed to remember what we learned last week when we're reading the passage this week yeah. and having a, a coherent whole, he's suspicious of that. But because he is so bent on obeying the text in front of him, um, that is a healthy uh, antidote to much theology instead of Bible reading and obedience. So I think that there's a, a lot, a lot that, that we took away from being uh, brought up in this household that I'm forever grateful for. But I think that that could be improved on in such a way that it brings an improvement into classic reformed thinking, where you're, you're not, uh, reformed theology is too often people with 50 pound heads, you know, and, and not enough practical application. Right. Historically, the reformed were very much in the trenches, and modern uh, reform types are more academic, and so I've just, wanted to bring that uh, graft to the aisle of the wild olive branch of my dad's renegade evangelicalism into uh, classic reformed theology. Yeah. That's basically, I, I was there, I, remember, I was aware, I was human enough to be self-aware as my dad became reformed. Um, and that process happened, and it was all an outworking of what does the Bible say? Right. Just what does it say? Yeah. And what does it say here? And is that fighting with what it says over here? Are, the, is, are different parts at odds with each other, or is it a coherent whole? And if it is a coherent whole, then unifying it makes sense. But uh, I, do, I do still enjoy getting heckled by my grandfather. <laughs> well, and I'm sure it's, it's a blessing. If we're talking about practical Christianity, as a child growing up in a, in a home where your dad is saying, what's the Bible say? Like, what sort of effect does that have on you and your formation? What, as your dad is leading. I have nothing to compare it to, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, that's the default setting. Right. That was the factory settings. I don't have another experience. Yeah. Um, mom and dad were both that way, and they both kept very short accounts yeah. with us as kids, held themselves accountable to scripture, and that made it, yeah. I mean, it was, it was never something for us to challenge. Neither right. my sisters nor I ever went through a phase of rebelling against that sure. uh, in any way, yeah. so. I think, and it was because of their consistency with it, I think. Yeah. And that's practical Christianity for a home. Yep. Is what's the Bible say, and let's live it top to bottom, dad to kids. I just yeah. real quick, and that, that progression in um, first, what was it, second, second Timothy, where add to your faith, um, goodness, and what was great about uh, just growing up in my dad's household was that that adherence to the, the goodness, and that's what I really appreciate about what Doug has done in, as far as the, the, being a pastor is adding, now dad was knowledgeable, but he added so much more. Um, it just put everything together, but too often many, many people are going after, you, you, read, uh, you meet people that are in our camp, but don't have that sure. wonderful background of practical Christian living, and you can see why it is a big turnoff 
to my my, my dad. Yeah. They don't have the, the virtue. Right. Right. Uh, Nate, I'll direct this one to you since you're the voice in question in this question. Uh, someone says online posts need to be winsome, and yet statements like "wokey McWoke face" is fair game. Is mockery warranted? If so, when? And when does it cross the line? I thought that was winsome. <laughs> it, was, it was affectionate. It was, it was winsome. Um, it worked great. Yeah. <laughs> so it's born, it's born fruit. I've, I know of multiple people who have understood that affection, have self-identified as Wokey McWokeface signed emails that way. Uh, they don't, you know, that's not seen as fighting words. Right. No, I think that it's, it really did work. Uh, as far as the line goes, of course there's a line uh, and we're nowhere near it. And that's, uh, for anyone who has ever read the book of Ezekiel, you know we're nowhere near that line. The line is real. Uh, I'll let you know when I see it on the horizon. Yeah. I'll, I'll direct this one to Pastor Doug. Uh, I've been struggling with forgiveness and reconciliation for about six years, someone writes, and I consistently ask God to transform me and remove this sin. When bitterness pops up or I sin because I'm still healing from this trauma, I confess, repent, and ask forgive, for forgiveness. Uh, is there anything more I need to be doing? Yes, I would say that if, if it's a recurring thing, if you have the full intention to forgive the way the Bible teaches that you should forgive, and something seems, um, there's a disconnect in it where it keeps coming back. Uh, go back to my illustration, there's two things. Go back to my illustration of the wound. The fact that the wound is tender, the fact that it needs to be bandaged and it needs to be cared for does not mean you're bitter. The wound is tender. The issue is, is the wound infected? All right, so bitterness is an infected wound. A tender wound is simply a, a wound. That's the first thing. But if the person's been dealing with it for years, six years, the chances are good that you're dealing with an infection, and the chances are also good that there's something about forgiveness that you don't understand theologically, where you're, where you're, where you're trying to do something that the Bible doesn't tell you to do, and you're not doing something the Bible does tell you to do. So the thing I would encourage you to do is um, uh, start to study your adversary. You're at war. Um, Start to study your adversary, start to study the techniques. I can recommend a couple of books, um, Unpacking Forgiveness by Chris Braun. I think it's Chris, B-R-A-U-N, Unpacking Forgiveness, and From Forgiven to Forgiving by Jay Adams. Uh, they, they won't agree, I don't think, in every detail, but I think there's some good, solid uh, information from Scripture on what forgiveness actually is. Um, Gary, uh, someone writes in, uh, we've heard it said, and I think it's quoting Johnny Cash, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Um, so when you referenced the memorization of Pi, you said it was dismissed, uh, it can be dismissed by someone's family as simply a hobby. Uh, how can we prevent ourselves from being hobbyist Christians and be practically applied people? Really, out of how to answer that, um, I think by the very fact that you are, you are applying the scriptures. I mean, you, you see something taking place, you make an assessment of it in terms of what the Bible says about it. There's, there's got to be a reaction personally to how you're responding to it, uh, looking at ways to accomplish a task related to it. Uh, we were in the hallway be before this talk and talking to a, a, a couple, asked, they asked a very poignant question about essentially what do we do in a particular situation and as I was going through it I was I was working through all the different factors involved of what would be necessary in order to get to this to, to actually get to the point where you to get to this end, end point goal um, and sometimes it just takes a, a process of elimination of this factoring in this bringing this in bringing counsel in from someone else uh, it's, it's a process that I think gets easier over time the more you begin to do it like, like any action that you learn to do. Toby, uh, someone writes in, and so as a pastor, what would be your response to this question? Is weekly Lord's Day worship the keystone for practical Christian living? And if so, why or why not? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, and it is, I think, uh, first and foremost, simply because um, it's what God calls us to do. We're, we're called uh, to gather with God's people. We're called uh, to um, praise him, to hear his word proclaimed, to remember what he's done for us, and to celebrate that at the table. Um, I think you, an argument can be made that everything that we're doing in the worship service itself, though, is a kind of, a, to, to Gary's talk, a, a internalization of what we're supposed to be doing all week long. And so we're, we're called to be God's people. We're identified as his people. And so we go out as his people. Um, we confess our sins. We hear um, God's uh, reminder of his forgiveness. And so we're a people who are confessing our sins constantly. That's not strange to us to confess our sins because we're reminded of our need to do it every single Lord's Day. Also, we receive forgiveness, and so we're a forgiving people. We hear the word proclaimed and read and applied to our lives, and so we're a people who are then in the word. And we, we sit at the Lord's table and, and remember his kindness and his sacrifice and his love, and we go out and we share that fellowship with everyone around us. We receive God's blessing, and so we go out to be a people of blessing. So I think it, um, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, something that strike, uh, comes to my mind is that we also sing the psalms in our, in our worship. What better way to hide God's word in your heart than to sing it and set it to music? And, and uh, there's really no better way to get it inside of you than, than singing it together as well. Um, this will be a free-for-all. Um, I think it's sort of stemming from Pastor Doug's talk, but uh, you know, uh, it's a grab bag for any of you if you want to uh, take a whack at it. Um, we all struggle with bitterness, but I also recognize bitterness between a few sisters of mine who have unresolved conflict. How can we help friends or relatives who are in conflict? How do we help them see that their bitterness has to be addressed and, help, and, and how do you help mediate and guide, guide them to reconcile and forgive? The danger, of course, is that if you speak into a bitter, uh, bitterness situation that you see going on between A and B, or you know, you can frequently step in there and make it all worse. Um, you can't just say, "Here, I see that you're bitter. Let me help you." Um, <laughs> um, it's just not. Uh, that's just not smart. Um, one of the things I would suggest that you do is if you're close enough to the situation to speak to it, you're close enough to, to talk to God about the people before you talk to the people about God. And what I would recommend is that you, every time you see it, you pray to the Lord and ask him to open a door for you to say something. All right? Now, sometimes if it turns into a flame war, you must say something. You have to step in because you're not, you're not going to make it worse. It's already worse. <laughs> But if it's just a low-grade fever and you have a good idea, you're going to make it worse if you say something. That's not going to be the case if when you say something, it's the result of a divine appointment. And one of them asks you, do you think I'm bitter? Or I sometimes worry. Or, you know, and it'll be very clear when God opens the door and you just go through it and start handing out booklets. <laughs> Which are at the booth in the back there. <laughs> Right. And don't chicken out when that happens. Yeah. yeah and when Unfortunately, God, yeah. a lot of people do chicken out in that moment. They're worried about something, and then somebody says, do you think I'm <laughs> fill in the blank? And the first thing that's said, especially if you're female to a female friend, is no. <laughs> Absolutely not. And the cock crows in the back. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, I'll uh, take a whack. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, often, it's sometimes nice to not even know who is more in the wrong because immediately when you're trying to sort out the conflict, they want to know who's, whose side you're on. Right. And uh, just a case in point, I'm in the creation evolution movement and there's a lot of pettiness uh, in the, the scientific community and there's, there's a tiny little community and so I wrote an open letter, not knowing, you know, I, I didn't take sides. I didn't, I wasn't partisan. It was just pastoral saying, this is what the offendees need to do. This is what the offenders need to do. And verses yeah. um, telling what our Christian obligation is to make things right. And 
and because I was sort of referee neutral, um, I think it was much more received than, oh, well, whose side is he on? And if he's on the other guy's side, now I'm bitter at him. Um, so. That's what Paul does in Philippians in the quarrel between Euodia and Syntyche. Um, you don't have any inkling of uh, Paul taking any side. You don't know if they were both at fault or one was at fault. Paul just pleads with them to be at peace in the Lord. Uh, he doesn't take sides. Uh, Gordon, another question for you. Um, if the righteous, someone writes, if the righteous are as bold as a lion and a failure to confess causes us to be feeble, could a lot of the lack of manly or militant courage in the body of Christ um, and the advance of modernism be due to our own logs? Logs? Logs in our eyes. Oh, logs, yeah. Um, I Actually, that was one of my verses that I just didn't include for time's sake that one of the symptoms is uh, lack of, uh, we're scaredy cats, yeah. lack of courage. And I think it's not always the case, but lack of courage is often, um, you know, the righteous are as bold as a lion and the guilty flee when no man pursues. And so if you're afraid, there's, there's a good chance that there's a problem, a, a log. Yeah. Um, Gary, someone asks, uh, for, uh, and, and I guess this would be for any of you who would like to take a stab at it, um, uh, on the internalization of scripture, what would be your top five or more, if you want to, uh, your top five scriptures you'd recommend for young men preparing to leave home for the first time, headed to NSA, naturally? <laughs> <laughs> or I guess maybe, maybe to broaden that question, you know, what would be, where would you encourage a young man to begin to, to start as far as memorization of scripture, internalizing scripture? I, the, what I try to do is when I have somebody internalizing scripture, memorizing scripture, uh, I always start with the same process. That is, learn the overall arch of what the Bible is all about. Mm -hmm. So be able to sit down, from, go from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and lay out for somebody the timeline, the redemptive timeline, all the way through scripture. Once you have that skeleton, you start adding to it as you go through, as you go through scripture. Um, and then as you do that, my, my technique of, member, of, of learning scripture is problem solving. I try to create problems in my own mind and how to answer those, and I go to scripture to try to figure out what the Bible has to say about those particular problems and issues. That's how I've learned scripture. I've, I've been very difficult for me to sit down and memorize a bunch of scriptures uh, because I never knew what the context of them were. I mean, you, I remember when I was a new Christian, you got this little uh, uh, deal with a box and it had scripture passages in it and then you memorized those things and you flipped through them and you learned all those scriptures, but they weren't connected to anything. Uh, so over time, I've tried to connect scriptures with certain techniques that I have and then most, most of my learning about the Bible regarding everything is, is, is problem solving uh, things. And I, that's how, I never forget once I try to solve a problem from scripture, it sticks with me. Mm. Everybody is different. Uh, you may have a better mind than I do, but this is the way my, my mind works. Now, the scriptures about leaving, you know, leaving home, um, I don't necessarily have a category for that. I, I, I left home, and my parents were glad that I was gone, uh, <laughs> and um, I was glad to be gone. And that was, it wasn't the, pre the preparation for that, and I didn't grow up as a Christian, so I really, I, I really didn't know that. And I, I remember listening to um, James Dobson, he was almost weeping that when his son left home, and when our, our children left home, we rejoiced. Uh, not because not because they were leaving home, uh, but we felt that because we had done a good job, they were prepared for 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 what was going to take place. And then, sure enough, it worked. Uh, I, I think you need to you know, parents need to give their children confidence so that when they do leave home, there's a lot, great deal of trust and there's open communication always back to the home. That your children want to come back uh, to the home. Uh, 
So did you, you know, it's your job to prepare them and you should be, you know, look, I, you can be sad at how far away they go, you don't see them for a long time. Uh, my, my parents just didn't really seem that way because we're just, we were just a different type of family. Um, and uh, we enjoyed one another's company. We were together and we enjoyed, we didn't, we enjoyed when we were away. But your, fam your family is unique and you have to kind of make those decisions yourself. But your goal is to prepare them and then your children need to know that they haven't been prepared and that you trust them once they leave and keep the lines of communication open. I'll throw one other thing in uh, without disagreeing at all with what Gary said about the overarching, you know, having the big picture. I would say particularly for a young man leaving home, I would say that he should master and be mastered by the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs is addressed. Yeah, my, my son, listen to me. I'm telling you this again. I'm going to tell you this, especially about the strange women. Um, <laughs> it's repeated. Quite it's a bit. repeated. And, and that's also a feature of, of uh, parental. Notice how, how much repetition is a feature of um, godly child rearing. You, you, the fact that you re are repeating yourself doesn't mean that's a failure. Uh, you're, you're supposed to. I'm going to say this again, and I'm going to say this again, and I'm going to say it again. Yeah. So the book of Proverbs is tailor-made for young men. Yeah. That's great. Uh, question for Gordon. Tell, I'll tell a story first, and then I'll uh, ask the question here. We had a, back in the day, I was at a, uh, uh, the Bible school I worked at back in Colorado. We had a time where students would occasionally get up and confess their sins and one uh, student got up and said to another student, uh, I, when I first met you, I thought you were a really dumb guy. <laughs> and we realized at that point we should probably uh, stop doing the public uh, confession right. sort of things. Um, but so the, the question here is, knowing that we should confess our sins to the Lord, do you have any specific criteria for when you should or shouldn't confess your sin to people? Yeah, like I said earlier, um, if they don't know about the sin, you can just deal with it directly with yeah. God. If they were definitely involved and you've sinned against them, then, um, then you need to make it right, mm -hmm. e even if you have to eat a lot of humble pie. And um, I don't know if that answers everything um, that you're after. But um, rule, sometimes rule. you might not know that they know. Um, you might, and, and there, there might be some um, detective work to figure out, does that person know that I was uh, bitter or, or whatever? So. The other thing I just added would be that the general rule of thumb would be that the confession of sin should be as public as the sin itself was. Right. So if, if you barked at your wife in front of the kids at the dinner table, then the confession and seeking of forgiveness should be in the same context. Um, yeah. So on. And, and, and especially a lot of parents just are very hesitant about uh, um, confessing their sins to their kids. Um, and their kids know that they sin against them, but the dad just doesn't want to come before their three-year-old and kneel down and say, I'm, will you, I, I uh, was impatient with you, will you forgive me? And that is something that men need to know how to do, whether it's their wife or their kids. And that, it, it's not about being, uh, none of us are perfect, but you're worried about your, your kids um, chucking the faith or tubing out, the most likely that, that, that thing that we fear of the kids tubing out is not because you failed to live a perfect life, but you failed to acknowledge your sins. And if you are humble before your kids and they see that, that is going to speak volumes. And um, pile, to pile on real quick, Assuming all that, that you do maintain humility and you are open to correction and you will confess your sin to your three-year-old, to your yeah. wife, to your husband, uh, know that in our culture, apologies have been weaponized and do not, under any circumstances, apologize 
or confess your sins when it's a lie. Mm -hmm. Like, do not do it. And this is something we're very, very quick to do. It's one of the ways that we put rings in the nose of uh, in the noses of people we want to control. Is people get hurt feelings, and it's completely a, a, you know aside from what that guy might have done. But they need to control him. They need to get a ring in his nose. So how do they do it? They get hurt feelings. A wife does this to her husband. Uh, people do it in churches. People do it in institutions. And they want to lead you around by that ring. They want to make you apologize for whatever they say. And while you should be open to considering any rebuke that comes your way, and, and really consider it prayerfully and in humility, and be quick to apologize and seek forgiveness, naming the sin specifically, not with a euphemism, you know, not apologizing for the misunderstanding or for something like that, but for being angry or for being rude or like be specific. But then from there, uh, do not ever, ever, ever participate in a lie uh, that involves confession of a sin you don't think happened. Or, yeah, confession of sin just to make peace um, when you it's another way of saying sin. never negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, bit of a, uh, open this up for more of a discussion here. Um, this, this conference is the School of Practical Christianity. And uh, given the moment we're in where there's, uh, if, if ever there was a need for practical Christianity, practical Christian living, faithful Christian homes, this is obviously a moment for it. <laughs> And, and yet, the, the common misconception is that, um, that practical Christian living, that there's somehow a dividing line between that and mask mandates, or mandatory vaccines, or an election coming up. How does, so just sort of freewheeling discussion on how do we, as Christians, how do we navigate the, the season before us? How do we apply, be faithful in our homes, and how does that affect then the big picture, the, the, the year 2020 that we're living in? Um, how does that affect the, the big picture stuff? And one, go. one, two, three, not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give a plug for a canon book um, by C.R. Wiley, um, Household and the War for the Cosmos. Yeah. If you haven't gotten it, I strongly recommend you do. Um, that's one little booklet um, where um, Pastor Wiley is connecting the significance of uh, piety in the home, in the family, and the marriage uh, to um, the cosmos. Um, it, and, uh, and it's um, very, very helpful in demonstrating, particularly in Ephesians 5 and 6, where Paul's walking through um, husbands and wives and children and parents. Um, it, Paul's not just saying, you know, this is a good idea and this is the good Christian thing to do. It flows right into Ephesians 6 where Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to withstand because our fight is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. Uh, if you want to be involved in that war, that battle, then husbands need to love their wives as Christ loved the church and sacrifice themselves for their brides. And wives need to submit to their husbands as the church does to Christ in all things. And children need to obey their parents and parents and fathers in particular need to raise up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's all tied into that. For Paul, he's not just giving you random, like this is a good thing to do, you'll be Boy Scouts and people will like you. He's saying, this is how you participate in that cosmic spiritual battle. So uh, household and the war for the cosmos would be a great place to start. Second observation is that practical Christian living in the home is most necessary in this time of turmoil out there, yeah. uh, precisely because a lot of people don't want to come into conflict with anything out there because they, they don't have the resources to open up a two-front war. Um, they're, they're battling in the home, the, you know, the marriage tensions or estrangement from kids, and they've got this conflict going. So why would they want to open up another conflict uh, with the world? I've got enough troubles, that sort of thing. If you, are, um, if you are at peace with God and your family is at peace with God and you're at peace with one another and you're walking in harmony, you are 
equipped to be a Christian warrior because a warrior doesn't fight because he hates what's in front of him, but rather, as Chesterton says somewhere, because he loves what's behind him. You, you fight because you're defending something, and the thing that you're defending is not, just, not something you're tangled up with. It's you, these are your people. You love them. You would lay down your life for them. They would do the same for you. And things are right. And when things are right at home, you're not, you don't go out to the battlefield feeling disqualified from the get-go. How can I trust God to take out Goliath when I can't take out anything at home? <laughs> not even the garbage. <laughs> I think, uh, Pastor Doug, you've talked about um, in, in this moment where uh, wearing a mask is a, uh, a virtue signal oftentimes, or you know, wear it so that you show that you love your neighbor. Um, you talked about um, if you're the one not wearing a mask, your neighbor should be scratching their heads going, wait a second, that's the most loving, uh, the person who loves their neighbor more than anyone I know, and there's that disconnect that they should have. Right. So here, here's the question I would present to you. Would you rather be, um, this applies to any ethical area, would you rather be not a racist and have everybody think that you're one, or would you rather be a, uh, a racist, an actual racist, and everybody thinks you're not one? Would you rather be a coward? <laughs> uh, would, would be honest understand. with yourselves. <laughs> Now, this is not a trick question. <laughs> With every head bowed and every <laughs> eye closed. <laughs> do you want to be, do you, if uh, the reputation of being virtuous versus actually being virtuous? And we say, and you might say, well, that's an ob the answer to that question is obvious, right? And I'd say, okay, uh, let's talk about masks. Masks are ineffective. They're dumb, scientifically stupid. You're tra you've, got this, you've got this Petri dish <laughs> strapped on your face that you're touching all morning, right? And then you're touching the doorknob of the store that your neighbor is behind you is going to go through, and, and then you drop it on the restroom floor. You're in, you're at Target, you're in Target, and you drop your mask on the restroom floor, and you think, oh, the dirtiest place on the planet. <laughs> I could, put it on, I could put it on and go out and everybody thinks I'm responsible, but I know that I just dropped it on the restroom I'm floor. I'm just gross. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being gross out here. But everybody thinks I'm wonderful. And if I put the mask in my purse or in my pocket and walked out, everybody would think I was an enemy, enemy of humanity, but I know that I'm loving them. All right? And you can all see right away how much peer pressure, uh, how much influence peer pressure has on us. So uh, when Colin Kaepernick was the only one kneeling, right, uh, whatever you think of his politics, and I don't think much of them, at least he was doing a thing all by himself. At least he's courageous. At least, at least he was, least he was yeah. yeah, he was out front. And now you've got to be the one courageous athlete if you're not kneeling, and everybody in the middle is just going with the, going with the flow. So the thing that we have to Basically, we should be a congregation, we should be members of one another, we should be members in the body of Christ, but we, are, we should be a, a pack, not a herd, right? It's, uh, we, we need to be tough-minded and uh, answerable to God and not sway, not lemmings, not swayed by panics and stampedes and that sort of thing. And what is everybody going to say? If, if I go into this store without a mask, what is everybody going to say? What are the optics? You know? what, are, what are the optics? What are people going to say about me? Well, what's the, what's the truth? Right. What, what would really be loving uh, my neighbor? If you want um, a lot of fun, you can look up on, on YouTube pictures of a guy in a mask vaping through the mask. Oh. And then all, all the smoke. And you can see just how effective th those things are. Not uh, Anyway. They're, those masks are a talisman, they're a signal, they are a badge of servility. They're, they are the servility badge. And, and that's why there's such an, a concerted effort to get you to conform. You just saw the thing maybe about the Wisconsin agency that was requiring employees. Department of Natural Resources. Department of Natural Resources. You had to wear a mask even if you're on a Zoom call. 
<laughs> you could be in your own home, in your own basement. If you're on camera, you have to put a mask on. They must think we're mushrooms. They just... <laughs> They keep us in the dark and shovel manure on top of us. <laughs> I, I, I have a, a question. Do you think a, a lot of this, a lot of people comply because they're afraid of the confrontation, public confrontation, especially when some of them have been ex extremely violent and they don't, you know, they may be with a child or so forth, and they just feel like, look, this is just kind of the easiest thing to do just to get through this. Right. Um, yeah, and I think that there are places where um, it'd be fine, to, you, you need to go into Costco because you need 50 pounds of almonds or whatever it is you. <laughs> For the fruit of your practical Christian living. <laughs> because it's Tuesday, and you need 50 pounds of almonds. And, you know, they, you need to get your hair cut and they won't serve you. You know, there's situations, I don't think it's sinful to put on a mask, but I think we ought to be kicking and resisting every chance we get. And you sometimes don't want to throw down, you know, you don't want to have a big battle, especially if you have a, a big battle and you're afraid that you won't know what to say. When they come after, they know what to say. You're selfish, you're self-absorbed, you're doing all that, and you don't have your argument, you, you're just going to get a gallon of milk and... <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have your arguments lined up. Now, there are plenty of times to just be pragmatic and just get through. You don't have time for the fight. You know, you do, this is a private business. They can ask me to do this. It's like, it's kind of, I mean, we're, if we believe in the free market, it's their property. They want to they wanna set this restriction. I don't have to go or I can put the mask on because it's theirs. Um, it's, there's a lot of reasons why different people would choose to put a mask on or not. It's just a question of, the, the virtue question is that, be that beating heart thing of, are you doing it to be seen? Are you doing it to get through? Are you doing it to get home with the almonds real quick? Um, you know, like there's, there's a lot of different motivations. Uh, final question for your discussion would be uh, November 4th this year. Woot. Uh, <laughs> can't come soon enough, that sort of thing. Um, Stay away from downtown Baltimore. <laughs> Whether it's, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, um, advice for Christians heading into what, either of those, of the, of those options. I, mean, I guess you could move here. That's true. Uh, with the, you know, with a, you know, like-minded, more like-minded people. Um, so, I don't know, this is, in 2016, we were on vacation at St. Martin, and uh, I, I had, I had no, I wasn't, I wasn't optimistic at all. I was, I just said there was no possible way that Trump was going to win. And uh, I got up, I could, I could not sleep. I went into a, there was another bedroom in there and I turned on the TV and I was in absolute shock <laughs> at, what, at what I saw. Um, and you and the whole Hillary campaign. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm post mill, but I wasn't that post mill. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what the categories are anymore. They've, they've, they've changed so much in the last few months. Um, I, I know my wife, my wife is a lot more outgoing and personable than, than I am. Uh, and she, she goes out and people in the store come up to her and ask, hey, does you know, do you, this color go with this and all those things? Not that they think they should work, they just think she, she just looks like she would know that. <laughs> And then she ends up talking to the person for like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> and it's amazing to find out, she finds out what these people are thinking. They, they discuss politics with her. You know, two things you don't talk about are politics and religion. And she'll come back and say, here's what they said about politics, and this is what they said about religion. And she, she would come back with, this, this, this woman was a Christian. Um, but I don't think that generally people, a lot of people today don't want to tell people what they're thinking about things. Uh, so I, I, am, I have no idea what's going to take place. I, uh, I'm going to get as many absentee ballots as I can, and I'm going to vote for Trump 30 times. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here yeah. first, folks. They'll, they'll, mail, they'll mail you a box. So, they're probably mailing the other people, so anyway. So um, uh, 
echoing all that. I, I'm, I, I don't know what the future holds other than nine miles of bad road either way. So it's going to be, it's going to be a rodeo either way. Uh, I can't, although I'm not predicting this, I can tell you what I'm bracing for. And what I'm bracing for is a Trump landslide. Um, because I think the, the Christians are going to have to um, keep their biblical uh, hat on, keep their, their biblical worldview going, because I think uh, rioting and burning down cities is not the way to the hearts of the American people. That's, I just think they've way overplayed their hand. I think it's going to be, um, a, a, I think Trump is going to win. But I believe that if Trump wins, it's not going to be conceded. I don't think it's going to be, I think it's, I don't think anything is going to be settled on election day. So, uh, other than the coronavirus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, yeah. I saw a great meme, a, doc, a patient is talking to her doctor. Do you, when do you think this pandemic is going to be over? And he said, I don't know. I'm not really that much into politics. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I think that the, that's going to go away. If Trump wins, it's going to be some new outrage, some new thing. And every, I think we're going to be, uh, America has not been this divided since 1859. And I believe that if Trump wins, it's going to, it's going to uh, be ca uh, chaotic one direction. If Biden wins, it's going to be chaotic uh, in other ways, in, in other directions. So I think we need to be prepared to function as Christians and, and be Christian first and foremost. I was in a, at a conference in Atlanta, there was a couple hundred Christians in it, and someone asked, uh, um, there was some time to kill, and I think it was Gabe, asked, how many of you, it was conservative activist type Christians, how many of you did not vote for Trump the first time who are going to vote for him now? And the room, hands went up all over the room. It was. It, it was a, a lot of people, and that was before the uh, the riot. That was before the riots and before all of this. So I think we need to be flexible, uh, trusting in God. It's going to be a rodeo, and it's going to be a rodeo no matter what happens, because I think we're at a point of dysfunction. Ex expect the rioting to ramp up towards the election, because it's it's a particular game plan. It's a play that's being run. Uh, and the question is whether it backfires or not. I think it has a high likelihood of backfiring. But don't put your hope in the election at all. Right. Just don't. Uh, you have to focus on living like a faithful Christian with everyone within arm's reach. Everybody within arm's reach is what your obligation is. Uh, I, I look at November 4th, and I feel like we have the choice of being stuck on the back of a really enormous rodeo bull we're either hanging on with one hand to this huge rodeo bull, or we're already on the ground getting chased by it. <laughs> like, that's it. We're going to still be on the bull, or the, we're going to be on, the, on foot with the bull behind us. The clown ahead of us. And there's, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, several of the clowns have already been killed. <laughs> um, it's just, like, that's it. And it's, it's not like staying on the, the bull for... A, another few seconds is going to postpone the inevitable thing that we're going to be facing uh, at some point, which is the rebuilding of a culture. With that, let's give a hand to our speakers. Thank you, gentlemen, very much.